stalwart um, main Audubon supporter, um, runs a very successful local business, and is um, one of the most amazing, if not the most amazing, collector um, I've ever encountered. So uh, it, once Eddie's done, Deborah will step up. And as I mentioned, Deborah is the author, author of a forthcoming book um, about, uh, it's called The Narrow Edge, A Tiny Bird, An Ancient Crab, and an Epic Journey. Um, De Deborah's book is coming out um, courtesy of, um, of Yale University Press. She lives in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and writes about science, nature, and the environment. Um, she's also a visiting scholar at MIT. So uh, we are covering the science, historical, cultural, scientific uh, waterfront this um, this evening uh, with these two very fine speakers. And we'll let Eddie begin. Thank you, Charles. It's a privilege to be here. Maine Audubon leadership in Maine, National Audubon leadership nationally, and 40 other uh, groups throughout the states. Uh, in this moment in time, they provide a vehicle which we can all take advantage of. And so it's a privilege to be here. I'd like to recognize a few people myself. Uh, thanks for being here. I know many of you. My two bankers, Mike and Jeff Dad, <laughs> if you need a loan afterwards, see them. In addition, I have my great friend, Bruce, and Bruce is the wealthiest man in Maine, so he says. Is he single? And, and you know, he could be. And if you want to buy an expensive home, see him afterwards. Uh, and then on a more serious note, we had a party in August at the home and introduced Charles. And at the same time, we had 120 people and we brought in a number of green, doing the work organizations so that we can start to work together. So here tonight, Scarborough Land Trust, we have Kathy Mills, Executive Director, and then we have Friends of Casco Bay, very important work they're doing as well, but Kathy Ramsdell and Mary, et cetera. We have Mary Stone, who's a veterinarian with Center for Wildlife Health, and her theory is that cats reproduce, billions of birds are eaten by cats. She's focusing on that. Thank you. And, um, and uh, who else? Is a, Michael, my framer, which is, you've done a great job in all the art. But uh, it's great to be here with the art, so thank you. Um, I have 30 minutes to, and Walter Anderson, state geologist, he's a Patriots fan too. He's, 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 he's here. But, but, I have 30 minutes to cover 140 years, so we have some choices to thin it down or to speak quickly, so I'll try and do both. And there are three phases to this, the passenger pigeon and the extinction. Joel wrote a wonderful book, uh, speak to him afterwards, you can find it on the end, Joel Greenberg, go to Google, many pages he's been on the road for a year. Timely, timely, this is an appropriate with the anniversary of the extinction, 100 plus years, it's uh, reflective. So we're going to speak about that in the extinction. Then I want to talk about the movement, the protection of bird art movement, protection of birds through art and how we're writing, uh, that really turn the tide so that we are protecting birds. And then finally, uh, where do we go from here? So the passenger pigeon, we have a passenger pigeon here, it was a spectacular bird had the slaty blue, the copper, had iridescence coming through the body. There were between anywhere from three to six billion. When you go back, and Joel knows when you go back and research, you pull together a lot of information, and it varies, but billions, and many people here are birders, and you can remember seeing 5,000 starlings looping, and you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of birds. Well, just imagine for three days seeing four billion passenger pigeons fly over. <coughs> Alexander Wilson in the early 1800s, Audubon, they all write, and many others about the experiences. The English came over in their boats in the 1600s. They talked about these masses of birds, passenger pigeons, that were on Maine and on the East Coast. And um, they were one-third of the total population of birds in North America. And until the pilgrims and white men arrived, if you will, the population had grown, had been stable. 
Uh, they say they can reproduce three to four times a year. I question that. Um, here's, uh, we had morning doves nesting. Here's a passenger pigeon egg. And that female was on the nest for five or six weeks. Then you have to fledge the bird. You just do the math and food and time. But anyway, they were proliferating and doing very well. And they, um, their food was beech nuts primarily, acorns. Uh, they loved fruit. Pope Berry sort of had a pseudo name that shifted towards the, the passenger pigeon. Uh, they were in the evergreen trees, the hemlocks, the pines, the nuts. They were very diverse. And two billion passenger pigeons would consume over 17 million bushels of food a day. So you start to do the math. And so they would come into, they would feed on the ground, and it might be in farmland, they love the oats, etc. But they had a rolling type of thing where those on the ground are going, and when it's no more food, they're rolling over. So they were very aggressive. They were a large bird, 16 inches, and they needed a lot of food. Their territory, they were actually going to Canada. And in their migration, they would arrive in the northern climb sometimes in February, March, uh, which is early. They would start breeding. And generally in August, they would start to move south. And their wintering grounds were in the Carolinas, through Arkansas, down into Florida, down into Texas. Um, but their breeding colonies were incredible. And they would breed in an area that could be 40 miles long by two miles wide. They could uh, be breeding in an area that was six miles across, 20 miles by four miles. But they had a very loud call. And because they say when they were breeding in these colonies in the trees, it was deafening. And they liked the mature trees, the mature oaks, the mature pines, beech, etc. But when they bred, they would be 50 high on these branches. And the excrement below would be inches thick. And when the breeding season was over, they literally, it was like a hurricane had hit, and that area would be uh, no longer usable for many years. So they constantly moved. And I don't want to shoot. I, I have a passenger <coughs> pigeon at home that I consider bringing. But I just want to point out that the upper nostril was not as, actually in this male, it isn't as mine. Uh, and it's interesting the ages of your mounts. But they had a very open for taking in more air. They would fly 400 miles uh, in six hours. There was one breeding area where someone captured, killed, which and we'll get into the carnage, which destroyed them. But in its uh, crop gullet, um, it had rice, and the only rice was six hours away, 400 miles away, and it came back to the roost. They came back to the roost at dusk and to 10 o'clock at night, so there was this constant flowing, and, and there were stories of uh, people on their horses, and they would hear this incredible sound coming, and the horses would quiver because of the, the sound and the power and the wind. Um, there was a community where they knew migrating passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons would go out in flocks of millions and millions and tens of millions. And they would start to move around, breeding seasons over in the spring coming north. But then there's a massive three days where they really move. And these were tens of millions and billions of birds. And one story recants with this community where they knew, and they could hear it coming, and, and the horses went in, and the people went in, and people were on their knees praying, and for two hours the passenger pigeons passed over their community. And afterwards, the whole community was covered with the excrement of the migrating birds. So they, they, they were all of these stories relating to it. But the Indians were very respectful, and the Indians had lived with the passenger pigeons, native Indians. Um, they were careful that they would not kill the adults. Squab, fat squab, became a delicacy in the restaurants. Very tasty. The birds were tasty. Acorns, beech, fruit, etc. in the summer insects, by the by. Um, so 
they, the Indians were very respectful, and they would take the squab and not kill the adults because you want that procreation. Um, when the white man grew in numbers, uh, there was awful carnage. And you would have a large, let's say, for example, you had that six-mile breeding area. They would come in with their wagons, surround it. Farmers would bring their pigs. They fattened up and fed on the carnage on the ground. And they then had poles with tar that they would light at night. Uh, they had sulfur pots, which killed the birds rather instantly, millions dropping. And they even lit fire to the uh, grass in them beneath and just created this havoc. This, this awful habit, killing tens of millions of birds. And they would have to cart them off uh, in, in wagon loads. And for what reason? Um, you know, the, the, the market, so, so you had this carnage, and you had this mentality, which fortunately we don't have these days. And you have the Civil War, you have... Uh, Life wasn't the easiest, but there was this, this killing mentality, as I call it, uh, sadly. Uh, there were netters, very, from the very beginning, uh, relentless from really the 1600s till the end of the 1800s, were netters. And the netters, uh, Turk, Turk is our help, my helper tonight. Maybe, maybe we can send these around and here. Uh, you can see the nets, they were large with a big pole. Linda can be uh, the other man. Thank you. We have two bands. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, but you can see, and here's the mass flying over the community. But netters, in the state of Wisconsin, they had over 500 registered netters at one time. And nets could take upwards to 1,500 birds. They like salt and mud. So along the coast, Maine, uh, there were nets that, uh, as the birds were feeding, uh, would drop and upwards to anywhere from 800 to 1600 passenger pigeons. Tremendous carnage and, and certainly you couldn't eat them all. In the early 1830s uh, they were uh, killed, they were in barrels and they were sent to the markets if you will. And there were so many of them and the population wasn't great that for a penny you could buy as many as you could take away. The, and again it was useless carnage. But then the railroad developed, and the railroad going west, north and west, and then eventually in the 50s, a little after 1850s, you went to the Rockies, and so the population started moving west, but the population started increasing. And because of that population increase, you now had more demand for food and for passenger pigeons. But now you had telegraph, <laughs> and you had the trains. So, Telegraph was telling where these masses were. I, I mean, literally tens of millions, it could be a uh, hundred million birds, would move into an area and roost and settle and feed. Well, there was that word that they had moved. So they were relentlessly um, sought and killed and then sent to the markets. Um, this is a mystery painting. On the back of the mystery painting was this original, this is over 100 years old piece, so we blew it up. And what this piece says, that 500 families traveled, entire families, wherever the passenger pigeons went. And that these 500 families at one point filled 500 uh, they filled 100 railroad cars with passenger pigeons in the barrels. So you now have the barrel makers, the feather pluckers, the killers, and they would go to market. You know, that sort of mid-north, and the markets were in New York, where you'd swing down into New York, St. Louis. Uh, so it just was incessant carnage that continued. And... Um, the uh, shooting was another element of it, and as we started to get into the 1850s, they were actually declining. And 
There were two early laws, passenger pigeon laws, and uh, eventually there were laws to protect birds. And I, I was just astounded on, on, on reading. And so, in 1848, the state of Massachusetts passed a pas passenger pigeon law, and the law stated that it protected the netters. It said if you cut a net or disturb the pigeons from going into the net, you were fined $10. <laughs> and in 1858, so the ignorance, in 1858, um, in Ohio, there was passenger pigeon legislation to protect them, and it was shot down in a vote, saying there are so many passenger pigeons, they're so prolific, there are no issues, so we're not going to protect them. So the carnage continued. Um, some of the last uh, breeding groups which were in the main, 60 million, um, were in Pennsylvania and Michigan. And yet the killing continued in the carnage. And finally, um, that last major, and, and there were conflicting bits of information, but um, was that after that the uh, passenger pigeons had dispersed. And then you had spotty small groups that did uh, nest into the 1890s, and that was it. So we went from close, to, let's say, five to six billion birds to zero. And the question is, how, how did that ever happen? Where, where was the communication? And, and I struggle with that in, in my own mind. Um, I had some things laid out. I had people looking and covering things up. <laughs> but this... For, you know, this gives you a sense. Here, you know, this was life in like 1915 and 10. This is what life was like. You know, the telephone came in in 1890s, like, and and it really was rural. It wasn't like you're going to send a text to, you know, like let's protect these passenger pigeons. Like, let's have a meeting. Like, let's rally. It was none of that. So the communication issue was big. Uh, but fortunately, in, when I go to phase two of this, there were leaders, there were people so impassioned that they stepped forward, uh, and eventually that led to it. I, I love the um, Citizens for Green Scarborough, Elizabeth. That, that's my other group. She's a lawyer. If you need a good, hard-hitting lawyer, here she is. Margaret Mead, a committee can change the community. Seven of us in the town of Scarborough six years ago started fighting pesticides, herbicides, and said no. We had a great ally in Karen who was on the ordinance committee. She wrote a wonderful ordinance which we want to hand off to other groups. And through a vote, et cetera, we actually, the town, decided no more chemical pesticides, herbicides, and we're going to do organic. It's still in place. And we have all the packet to hand off. But, but the point was, the committee changed the community. But there was no committee back then wanting to change the community. Eventually, there was a committee that changed the nation and beyond, which we'll get into phase two. So it's very unfortunate. And in Joel's writing, Joel says the same thing. These are original passenger pigeons by Turk, Linda. These are, oh, These are original passenger pigeons on Cabo's 1840 um, by Audubon. Oh, so, so Audubon started and, and eventually the Audubon movement, and here we are at the Audubon nice in Maine, but um, like a National where, what, what happened? Where, where were the voices? And I was telling Joe, we, we chatted briefly, um, here's Arm and Hammer, 1908. A little late. Here's, this is the only piece of ephemera. Here you go, Dick. Pass that around. This is the only piece of ephemera that I really found that expounded upon the passenger pigeon and, and the unfortunate, and et cetera. That's 1914, Forest Stream. Bird Lore had 1930. Bird Lore was the leading thing, 1913. But they were fighting millinery issues and other issues, which we'll now shift to very briefly. So they were doing the work, and they were the committee, but they were looking past the passenger pigeon. And I say to myself, 
I love morning doves, but I hear people complaining that morning doves are eating the seed at their feeders. I mean, I see pigeons. Pigeons are like, gee, a rock dove. I mean, they're wonderful flyers. Uh, maybe there was this disrespect and not appreciation of nature uh, to be explored, but, but sadly. So, uh, in uh, the late 1800s, the Cincinnati Zoo bought 10 pairs. And this is closing the passenger pairs, bought 10 pairs. And they were trying to breed them in captivity, and what happened is they had too small a pool, so eventually it petered out. But they successfully had two bred birds that continued, and the last one was Martha, who died in September 1 uh, of uh, 14, 1914, and that was it. That was it. So, where do we go from here? By the by, I've got to give you one example. Um, things have moved on me here. Um, <coughs> this painting. What about it? And I, um, there's an intermediary, intermediary piece that went somewhere that, um, that was a sketch, and it said, we can accomplish whatever you'd like. Do you like this? And it was by Fuertes, and I saw that in a book. In. Is it there? Did it get out? Did it escape? Does David have it? David, can you hold that up? Okay, I'll take that. So, thank you. So, here on the left, on the right, this is an ink wash, and what it says is, I saw this in a book, but I didn't see the writing. Below it says, do you like this scheme? It's open to suggestions anyway. Obviously, where it is. So, here you go, David. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so I, I saw an auction and it said two pigeons in a tree <laughs> this is a long time ago I started in 2000 this is like 2002 and they weren't oh here we'll send you an image and we'll PDF and da 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 so I called it was a firearm sale and I said you know okay so I purchased it and it came in and I'm thinking it's got to be four days the way these birds etc but it's unsigned well, as it turns out, Fuertes did not sign his uh, pre-final paintings, his mock-ups, if you will, if you research it. So this is Fuertes. So I finally found the original three years ago, and I lost it at auction. I waited three more years to find it, and it came in, and I'm going, wow. So I'm thinking, this bird looks familiar. <clears throat> it's Martha. Martha. So I go back to this, and I'm reading this, and it said, we wanted Martha in the painting. So then I find this, fortunately, and so what company commissioned this in 1911? Ithaca Gun. <laughs> So you look, at, you look at the history and the messages and the what ifs and the whys, and, and here they are. And so we'll, we'll move into the next segment, um, but this becomes an important piece to tell this message. So let me just one tidbit as we move into the next segment. Any, if you're all set with the passenger pigeons, any, any burning thing you want to do? Uh, so, in 1911, a company approaches National Audubon and said, we will put up $125,000 to you, which would double their budget. Their budget was $125,000 if you partner with us and work with us. The company was Winchester Rifles. Oh. <laughs> and the reason was killing of ducks and, and game birds. They had a spring shoot, fall shoot, there were no laws. And they saw in the future that they wouldn't be selling any firearms because there wouldn't be any game left. I just took in today, in 1914, Maryland overview of uh, ephemera, talking about their laws to protect birds. And I was astounded. I got the page like four, and it said, 
and the law was passed in 1912, and at that point, in the freezers in the game marketplace were like 150,000 ducks, 40,000 grouse. Uh, they even had plovers, shorebirds. So this whole thing, um, fortunately, laws were in place. So you had two elements. We'll move into phase two. You had two elements. You had the philosophy was you have the ignorant people and then you have the bad boys. So we can educate the ignorant people who don't know. But for the bad boys, we're going to have laws and we're going to pass laws. So that was the beginning. It all starts in Boston and New England, it seems. In 1871, the Nuttall Ornithological Club began in Cambridge, Mass. William Brewster, independently wealthy. There were nine young men who loved birds and they got together. They incorporated in 1870, 1870, 1871, 1873. They then decided to put out this little bulletin called the Nuttall Bulletin. It became a scientific document that ornithologists appreciated worldwide. And so they then morphed in the American Ornithologist Union and in 1883. And part of that, and now, this winter, I had 20 Canada geese on, on the ice and the snow. And a lot of ducks were in a, a, a good nature area. And it just struck me. 17 of them were tucked down in the snow and the wind, but three of them were sentries. One in the front, in the middle, and in the back. You know, they were on guard. They understood it. They were the birds of authority. They were the leaders of that group. They were the committee that oversaw the community. And now we have the American Ornithologist Union, and in 1884 they formed the group, to, the group to protect birds. In there was Brunel. I like photos to see what these people are like. Vanna, I mean, sir. <laughs> no, I have a friend. We've been in Philly and Boston, and a friend of mine, Rich McGill, he's, we joke about being a man. I called him, I said, Rich can't make it. He's in Florida. Can Turk be our guy? Thank you, Turk. You're a great sport. He was the editor of Horse and Stream. February 11, 1886, he proposed the formation <coughs> of the Audubon Society. Audubon, he was the visible guy. So he proposed it. And it was a rocket. And this is one week later, the real deal. And how many people have heard of Frank Chapman's walk down Manhattan and seeing the ladies' hats and the birds? This is his letter in here. 700 hats, 542 with birds on them, 40 species. He, Whatever you see printed came from this, so you can compare, but it's in here. The American Ornithologist Union created a boilerplate on protecting birds. It's here. It was adopted by the state of Massachusetts, turn of the century, many others. So here's a leader. He started with the American Ornithologist Union. That was the beginning of the Audubon movement. 39 members in the first year started the Audubon magazine. Some were buried here. Here's a live Audubon magazine. It's the real deal. In November of one year later, 1888, it petered out. This is the last published Audubon magazine. Because Rennell was the only guy. He was funding it using his staff that put out a weekly newspaper, and it was free. In here, you read where people had donated $9. And there's also a list of, if you will sign up 10 people, et cetera, we'll give you prizes to children. And they were books, so it cost him a fortune. But he did it, and he set the precedent. Here's, let's take a look at that. So it petered out. But Frank Chapman, who worked for the American Museum of Natural History, was an impassioned bird. All the, I have five minutes. i got to really speak quickly. <laughs> i got to really speak quickly. He, thank you, Doug. He was impassioned about birds. He began bird lore. One of one, bird lore. And it became the vehicle for uh, 
into 1941 when it became Audubon Magazine. They purchased it in 1935, then became Audubon Magazine. So from 1888 to 1941, this is the first Audubon Magazine since. So he became bird lore and with great success and it really became the, the magazine that was fighting for protection of birds. Um, so, we're going to speed this up. Um, along the way, you had potters and you had no clay. And, and the clay really was, where's, where are the great artists that can have the visual? Everything was written. So, uh, in 18, so in, in 1903, this Abbot Thayer out of New Hampshire said, enough bird lore with these scruffy dead birds. We need live bird photos, or what we really need is a great artist, like the great portraiture people. If we could find one, then we could really break out. So, I'll backtrack to 1895. Elliot Cowes found one. He found Puertes, the great American artist. Oh, thank you. The great American artist. He, he then painted 50 paintings for meeting at the American Ornithologist Union while he went, and they were presented while he was in Europe at a glee club. This is probably the most important painting in the collection. This is one of those 50 paintings from 1895. And this changed the whole movement. This was taken to the Ornithologist Union, and, and that was the breakout, where now they had the great artists. One of the great women, Mabel Osgood Wright, Citizen Bird, partnered with Fuertes, and, and they were off and running. So what were they fighting? They were fighting millinery trade, plumage. Here's a snowy egret. Frank Chapman in, talked about the ladies' hats, and, and the men were, the ladies and the men combined were, were pretty naughty. The, the men were scaling eggs, robbing nests, nest collections, taxidermy. You see this taxidermy, Victorian taxidermy, right there? Millions of birds were, were killed for the millinery taxidermy uh, realm. And uh, so here's a snowy egret, and these plumes were prevalent on dresses and hats. So this became the lightning rod. Mabel Oscar Wright started fighting. Um, and in the end, uh, 83,000 workers in America worked in the millinery trade. That's one in every thousand, or 83 million people. So it was a hard lobby to fight. Ultimately, through this, they fought, and they were able to enact laws in 1900, 19, 11, 12, upwards to 17, and the laws were in place. So we just moved, what, 120 years. So now, uh, along came Chester Reed. So now you have to get people interested in birding. And Chester Reed, 1905, created the field book. And then here are the binoculars. Can we pass these on, sir? These are the four power. Roger Tory Peterson started with these four power. Here's another one. Four power. Can you pass that around? This is a field guide, so, honey, can you see? So, these, here you go, you send, send these around too. These are the, this was the beginning, here, with the field guides, Chester Reed. And so, you can imagine, those, those aren't the best, right? So, so the appeal of these wonderful images uh, showed the bird better than life, and, and it really grew. So, uh, Roger Tory Peterson joined National Audubon, 1935 as the art director, they created, they enhanced the junior members Audubon Club. By 1940, there were six million, this is the six millionth junior Audubon member from 1910. So, so where are we today? By 1954, there were nine million. And, and I'm reporting that we've really started to consider how do we get back to the youth. 
And finally, Roger Tory Peterson, Freight of the Field Guide. These are second firsts. You want to hand these on? Uh, these, are, these are second firsts. <laughs> if, if you look at the plates, they're gray versus white. And you can take them out and look, just don't draw them. Um, no, I'm kidding. So, so finally, here's a first verse. This is one of the first thousand ever produced. But the reason I mention this is you can't be a birder and enjoy the, the sport and the activity and the leisure recreation unless you have a road map. So you need the field guide. Out on this wall are Roger Tory Peterson's six plate paintings. 1947, two of them, where he went from cartoons, he's a cartoonist. But the one thing I want to point out is the key, if you're ever in the chase, is in the back, the bitter, the American bitter was, should have been the bog humper. In the first verse, it's called the bob humper. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, they corrected Bob, and he became Bob, but then they printed the next group, which is here, with still the gray, and then boom. But this is the beginning, and, and this is sig significant in my view. Uh, uh, this is significant in my view, uh, in that it gave you the tools so that you could become birders, love birding. We have 100 million birds. So the issue isn't getting people interested in birds now. It's pesticides, herbicides, nitrogen. Kathy and a group are saying that nitrogen runoff is worse than global warming. Just wait. And they have the science behind it. Um, thank you. You've been great.